Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, the Weather Program Office's first FY23 NOFO, Notice of Funding Opportunity Webinar. Uh, I am your host and moderator, Tamara Battle. I have with me today uh, Dr. John Tenhove, who is our Deputy Director of the WPO, as well as Matt Mahalik, who is our Research Transitions and NOFO Funding Lead. We also have a few extra speakers online today um, who are excited to tell you about our uh, NOFO for this year. So if you don't mind, let's get started. So first we'd like to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and will be available um, at the NOAA Central Library YouTube channel and all audience members during the time of this webinar will be muted. However, there will be a Q&A session at the end, so please feel free to enter any questions into the questions chat pane, which is being monitored throughout the course of the webinar. At the conclusion of the webinar, we will take any and all questions, and if we're not able to address all questions, certainly please uh, continue to, to post those questions because we will definitely take them in and be able to answer them uh, once the webinar is concluded. If you have any issues, we're also giving you a, uh, a phone number that you can call if you're having any connection issues, or if you want to con uh, connect by phone, you can dial 1-415-930-5321 and enter participant code 330-701-100 to be connected by audio. We also have a very handy hand, uh, handout that you can download at your leisure, which is a copy of the slides that we'll be presenting this afternoon. So please go to the handouts menu located in your GoToWebinar control panel and download the handout. Also, finally, closed caption will be provided uh, as part of the webinar after the recording is posted on the library's YouTube channel. So an overview of today's webinar will include, uh, include some of WPO basics to give you an idea of what the Weather Program Office is all about. We'll talk a little bit about the grants process, as well as the FY23 NOFO competitions, which include Vortex USA, Social and Behavioral Sciences, Observations, and Innovations for Community Modeling. We'll then give you some information on the application process, including eligibility criteria, tips to consider, as well as avoiding common mistakes, we also like to invite you to potentially become a reviewer in the future for WPO. And then we'll conclude with an opportunity to meet the competition managers for Q&A. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to John for a little bit of discussion about WPO. Take it away, John. Thanks, Tamara. So good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you're calling in from. In the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about WPO overall and where we fit within NOAA and the larger weather enterprise. The NOAA's Weather Program Office, or WPO, is within the Oceanic and Atmospheric Research Line Office, and we fund world-class weather research with the ultimate goal of saving lives, reducing property damage, and enhancing the nation's economy. We work closely with the National Weather Service and other offices within NOAA to integrate weather research from across the weather enterprise into operational forecasts for the nation. As you can see from the list on the right-hand side, we have a range of programs within the office that focus on topics across the weather value chain, from the very beginning of the value chain, such as observations, to the very end of the value chain, such as test beds and social and behavioral sciences, and everything in between. The next slide, please. So while we fund research that extends across the weather value chain, we also fund research that ranges across weather timescales, from minutes to months, even extending out to a year or two. The goal of all of our programs is to improve weather knowledge and develop products and services to advance forecasts across a range of hazard areas, including tropical cyclones, severe storms, winter weather, extreme precipitation, air quality, heat, and drought. Again, from very short time scales out to subseasonal to seasonal time scale. Next slide. The WPO operates at the center of the weather research enterprise, which includes federal agencies, state and local governments, academia, industry, and nonprofits to select and fund promising research that leverages strengths across the enterprise. WPO also works to support a strong and growing weather research network across the enterprise that facilitates research to operations transitions and operations to research requirements, gathering and feedback, and the development of the next generation of weather researchers. 
for numerical weather prediction, one of the key ways we help foster this weather research network or community is through EPIC, or the Earth Prediction Innovation Center, which supports a community modeling paradigm using open source and open science principles. In terms of student development, in addition to hosting Lapenta scholars and AAAS fellows, Sea Grant fellows, and Pathways interns in-house, we also are launching a student program, student fellowship program, called WPO Innovation for Next Generation Scientists, or WINGS, in the coming months, focus on supporting doctoral work in areas where we know we need to develop more graduates to meet demand. This is the WPO-wide program being piloted by EPIC, and we expect to support two to four students with a 50K stipend per year, more information will be provided to the community in the coming months, including at AMS. Next slide, please. So our funding priorities in WPO are driven by a few key pieces of legislation, including the Weather Act of 2017 and its reauthorization in 2019. And over the last year, WPO has been developing a new strategic plan, which we will release at the American Meteorological Society meeting in January or before that. As part of that plan, we've interviewed over 50 individuals, internal and external to the organization. We've aligned our priorities and our new strategic plan with NOAA, OER, and Weather Service strategic plans, as well as the 33 recommendations and the priorities for weather research report, which was recently published by the NOAA Science Advisory Board. On the right side, you'll see we also, also strongly support diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility initiatives, both within our office, but also within our funding opportunities. We hope to broaden our funding opportunities to be more accessible, to more diverse set of institutions and individuals, and also to cultivate a more diverse weather science research workforce over time. One of the key reasons we're doing this webinar today, in fact, is to try to make more of the community aware of this funding opportunity and to answer any questions that may have prevented one of you from applying in the past. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, transitioning weather research operations and applications is really a key priority for our office, and our program managers in WPO help bridge that gap through facilitating the development of transition plans, uh, and transition meetings that connect our funded investigators with operational managers within NOAA. In addition to transitioning specific tools or products to the Weather Service, we also transition knowledge to other researchers or practitioners, or we transition code to the community through public releases. So, you know, in other words, while Weather Service is definitely the primary beneficiary of our research, it is not the only beneficiary. Next slide. So given that focus on transitions, WPO really strives to balance the immediate needs of NOAA operations with investments in innovative higher risk approaches that may pay dividends over time. The numerical readiness level scale on the left side there um, is from one to nine, and it shows that, and, and it's depicted in terms of a funnel, and it's designed to track project maturity across the spectrum from research to development to demonstration to deployment. And as the project moves down that funnel, it gets closer to operations. So you can see that most of our active projects in WPO are in the readiness level three to five range, followed by the readiness level six to eight range. And so while transition to operations and applications is definitely a key priority and a metric for success for us, we also understand that innovative, more exploratory work is needed to fill the top of the funnel and is critical for sustaining future advances. And so as we talk about our FY23 funding opportunity, we'll, we'll mention um, how we're targeting different RL levels based on that competition. And we also try to balance uh, funding uh, for external investigators in industry and academia with internal investigators in NOAA laboratories or the National Weather Service, particularly um, for the internal investigators to test and demonstrate previously funded weather research projects to get them ready to transition into operations. So you can see the, from the chart on the right that in terms of the large majority of our active awards um, as of FY21, um, they're, they're still largely provided externally with under a quarter being provided uh, internally and we've just um, are completing the FY22 process and we'll be announcing um, over 50 awards that we're making um, as part of that competition in the coming weeks. The next slide. So um, most of WPO's external funding is provided through what's called the Notice of Funding Opportunity or NOFO. Uh, and this slide provides just a few basics of that grants management process. Over the last few years, we've consolidated our multiple funding competitions into a single omnibus NOFO, which contains multiple programs competitions. So it's also important to note uh, that not every program runs a competition each year, which most programs now run competitions every two to three years. Um, but for those competitions, we receive letters of intent and full proposals, which we assign to both internal and external reviewers. Uh, based on those reviews, we rank the proposals and award them. Uh, and we do have the option, which we use sparingly, um, of selecting out of rank order or to transfer proposals across funding opportunities as we see fit to meet WPO and NOAA objectives. Next slide, please. 
So for our FY23 funding opportunity, we're accepting uh, proposals through November 17, 2022 for four programs, Observations, Vortex USA, Social and Behavioral Sciences, and Innovations and Community Modeling. All four competitions have generally the same rules, regulations, and deadlines. Um, and each competition has a unique set of science priorities and program managers that run those competitions. Each competition is also generally focused on a specific range of readiness levels uh, for the research it funds. Some competitions uh, call out that specific range and come, some competitions uh, don't. Um, but you'll, you'll hear about that in a few slides from the competition managers themselves. So next slide. So with that, I'll turn it over to the competition managers running each of these competitions. Um, Mark Vincent will first talk about observations, followed by Gina Esco to talk about social and behavioral sciences, followed by Jordan Dale to talk about Vortex USA, and then finally fo followed by uh, Jose Enrique Alves to talk about the Innovations for Community Modeling competition. And after that, our overall NOFO manager, Matt Mahalik, will provide a bit more information about the NOFO process itself. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Thank you, John. Um... Well, good afternoon. I'm Mark Vincent, and along with Sandy LaCourt and Renee Richardson, we manage the observation program. And first, I'd like to point out that I think the observations program has the most exciting and impactful projects in all of NOAA. Uh, if you take a look at our website for our FY21 projects, they span projects that strengthen the core of existing observing systems and really push the envelope of new technologies to fill gaps in coverage, performance and cost. For the current uh, competition, our, our focus is to develop, demonstrate and analyze, that's a new addition, uh, observing system technologies to benefit NOAA and the weather enterprise. And that's, you know, obviously we want, we want to advance NOAA, but we also want to support the broader weather enterprise, the commercial sector, state mesonets, et cetera. Um, the six priorities we have, uh, as you would expect, uh, these uh, tackle the things you see in the, the front page of the news every day and the Science Advisory Board has called out, such as analyses of existing weather observations, uh, fire weather, mesonet boundary layers, tropical cyclones, and uh, observing technologies of observations. Um, in the FY21 and in the FY23, the real cornerstones of the pillars that we're looking for in our proposals are in these three bullets at the bottom of the page. And th this is what we, we tell people that they should focus on. Uh, we wanna see substantial collaboration with one or more operational weather stakeholders. That can be NOAA, private sector, uh, state emergency um, managers, et cetera. We wanna see a linkage to operational needs or opportunities. And we want to see a potential to transition to operations, applications, commercialization, or in the case of the analysis, to a final product that, um, that NOAA or other operations can use. So that's my quick summary. And again, I want to emphasize that uh, observation program has the most exciting and impactful projects in all of NOAA. I will turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Mark. And I'm, I'm willing to put up a good competition here for the best program and the best PIs. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gina Esco. I'm the program manager for the social science competition. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm not going to read everything on the slide. What I do want to share is that social science is really about understanding the humans uh, in our systems. And in fact, we need observations just the same way uh, our physical science counterparts does as that, that Mark just talked about. We need to uh, develop, test, and validate methods that collect data in a variety of areas. And that's why you see us using that phrase in our science priorities. We have a wonderful mission here in NOAA to save lives, protect property, and, then, and enhance the national economy. And we need prod projects, excuse me, that help us explicate that, to help us show that value. So you'll see us uh, suggest product or service improvements areas to collect data to understand that value, uh, to increase our understanding of perhaps audiences that we don't know enough about. Some areas that we have, it's all in that NOFO, read it. It's like a syllabus. You tell your students to read it, we tell you to read our, our NOFO, right? Um, we bring things up like collecting data and developing methods to understand end users' information ecosystems. We hear so much from our operational partners that they don't understand 
uh, how information, our information, blends with other types of information that actually informs an outcome. We'd like to better understand those processes. In addition to that, we have a number of uh, sub-priorities there, one on flood, precip, and fire weather. Those are hazards that are particularly uh, important to us right now. There's another priority on operational meteorology information ecosystems vulnerable and or underrepresented populations, and then that socioeconomic value of improvements of information as well. The second main priority is improving our understanding on personalizing and localizing verbal and visual information. We often hear from our partners and publics that they want more personal information or more localized information. What does that mean? Is increasing our special spatial resolution enough? Or is there something else, right? And we're hoping that this uh, wonderful group of academic partners can help us understand what that means. You can do it far better than we can, right? That's why we need partners. And the last one is very important and something that we see very much in the news, which is um, how emergency managers integrate climate change, uh, climate scale considerations in short-term weather. It, it's no longer good enough for us just to look at the past to inform our future. We actually have to look at future projections to inform our planning and our mitigation right now. And how might we help our partners uh, through that? Or is there another way uh, that we can assist in that process? And so seeking projects on that. So again, a couple of things that we emphasize in our projects, collecting data, developing methods, and helping us improve those products and services. Thank you so much and back to Jordan. Good afternoon. Thank you, Gina. I'm Jordan Dale, and I'm the program manager for the FY23 Vortex competition. The, vor the verification of the origins of rotation in tornadoes experiment, known as Vortex, is a program that is co-managed by NOAA's Weather Program Office and the National Severe Storms Laboratory in Norman, Oklahoma. The Vortex program started as Vortex Southeast in 2015 as an effort to understand how environmental factors characteristic of the Southeast affect the formation, intensity, structure, and path of tornadoes in the southeastern United States. Since then, the Vortex program has expanded to include the broader United States under the acronym of Vortex USA. The FY23 Vortex USA competition is administ administered by WPO, while NSSL developed the science priorities. This year's competition aims to integrate physical and social science research through four priorities, including advancing the forecasting, a continuum of environmental threats known as FACETS framework, improving NOAA's forecast and warning capacity, and improving societal response to tornado threats and impacts, increasing our knowledge of meteorological processes and societal impacts of tornadoes nationwide, and through gaining an improved understanding of unique regional challenges that heighten tornado vulnerability. So if you have more specific questions, I encourage you to um, ask them during our Q&A session, or you can reach out to me directly. Now, Henrique will tell you more about the next competition. Next slide. Thank you, Jordan. Hi, everybody. My name is Jose Henrique Alves. I'm, I'm the manager for the Innovations Competition. So in our competition, we're seeking high-risk, high-reward projects with broad community engagement and collaboration to accelerate scientific research and modeling contributions. Our ultimate goal is to improve the skill of the Unified Forecast System, UFS. The UFS is a community model used operationally by the National Weather Service. The UFS can provide weather, ocean, air quality, and coastal systems forecasts spanning timescales from a few hours to two years. Our competition will fund innovative proposals that will modernize modeling infrastructure, provide community support, and accelerate community innovations. Next slide, please. The Innovations Competition is a collaboration between four WPO programs, JTTI, EPIC, S2S, and Atmospheric Composition. We're accepting proposals addressing priorities in three program areas. Numerical, numerical weather prediction capabilities, Western states hydrology, and fire weather sub-seasonal to seasonal forecasting. We're encouraging applicants to align proposals with the EPIC program capabilities. Working with EPIC means uh, developing code with multi-platform multi support using open development GitHub repositories, using community infrastructure tools and cloud-ready containers developed by EPIC, 
And integrating code testing to the automated EPIC continuous deployment CI-CD pipeline. We hope to receive proposals that are innovative and expand community engagement in the development of the UFS. We want to fund projects that focus on substantially new approaches and not on incremental changes. Funded projects in our competition should envision the UFS of the future, innovating the design or bringing innovation to capabilities expected to be implemented into operations in five years or later. We look forward to supporting you and your projects towards making the UFS the most accurate and reliable weather forecasting system in the world. Thank you, and I think it's back to John. Actually, it's over to Matt. <laughs> hey, thanks so much. Uh, I'm Matt Mahalik, uh, the Research Transitions Lead. This is such a great opportunity to kind of talk about all the different competitions that are in one place in the WPO NOFO this year. Um, I know I'm getting excited just thinking about all the different research that can get funded through this. And, um, and so hopefully you are too thinking about all the different possibilities that uh, these competitions can support. So what I'm here to talk about now is a little bit more into, um, is this NOFO right for me? I'm hoping we can kind of all think about, um, think about the different opportunities that we might be able to take advantage of here. Um, and some of the specifics into uh, what would make a, a really competitive proposal. So first off, if you're thinking about getting uh, your toe into the water here, um, a couple of considerations that I have up on the screen. I'm not going to be able to go through everything in the next few slides, you know, line by line here. So I'll encourage you to download um, the handout that is attached to this and also make sure that you're going over to grants.gov to take a look at the NOFO itself in full. So as you're considering whether you're going to submit a full application here, um, think about is your idea appropriate for the competitions that we just went over? Are the R&D activities innovative? Are they ambitious? Are they going to make an impact um, and eventually transition to some really exciting application? Um, are you going to be able to have the support of your department and organization? We want to make sure that your work is aligned with your organizations as well. Um, and of course, the outcomes, are they aligned with some sort of need, either in operations, in the commercial sector, or within the weather enterprise in general? Um, in order to transition something to a meaningful application, we need to make sure that there's buy-in from all ends. And I would recommend that um, you coordinate with potential applications, um, potential applications um, really from the beginning and all throughout the proposal. Um, and then also think about, is the competition, another competition going to be a better fit? So we have four different competitions within WPO, um, but there are plenty of other funding opportunities outside of WPO, whether it's in NOAA or across NSF, any other sources. So consider some of the other opportunities that are out there in case some of the limitations that we're about to talk about um, might not work out for you. So we'll move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so who is eligible to apply here? Because there are some limitations. In WPO, we try to make this as inclusive um, as we possibly can, but there are limitations to the types of federal funding that we're using here. For our funding opportunity that we're talking about right here, eligible applicants are from external, that is non-federal, colleges, universities, institutions of higher education, uh, the UCAR system, which includes the uh, which includes NCAR. Uh, cooperative institutes are considered to be external institutions here. So if you are a cooperative institute employee, you are an eligible applicant. Cooperative science centers, state local tribal governments within the US, and US-based commercial and nonprofit organizations are also encouraged to apply here as lead PIs. For federal institutions and contractors performing work directly for federal institutions, you are eligible to participate in the work, but not eligible to lead a project and request funding on your own. So what that means is that you must be partnered with one of the above fully eligible external institutions who would be submitting the full proposal. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what federal institutions are allowed to request in a second. Um, completely ineligible. Unfortunately, at this time, we're not we're not permitted to support international non-U.S. based institutions um, and also any other federal institutions that are not within NOAA or their contractors. So move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so for federal collaborators, even though unfortunately we're not allowed to fund you as a lead PI for these projects. We do encourage you to get involved with external institutions to complete some proposal because we want to make sure that you're involved here 
and federal collaborators really do provide some expertise to, uh, to make the most effective work possible. Um, so federal collaborators are not allowed to submit their own proposal, and there are very limited situations where they can request funding. Funding for federal collaborators uh, that is allowed includes federal um, critical project dependent travel, uh, project critical equipment, and pre-agreed upon overhead and indirect costs for affiliate institutions, and also select infrastructure and testbed related costs. Federal employee or contractor salaries are not allowed to be requested um, as a proposal in response to this NOFO. Uh, the same applies to conference or workshop travel or any other direct funding. And for the purposes of this NOFO, federal contractors are considered to be federal employees and follow the same restrictions. Federal collaborators, if you're anybody requesting funding um, or not requesting funding, if you're just participating in the project one way or another, um, you are required to either submit a letter of support or a collaboration form um, in order to provide documentation of your participation in the project because we don't want any surprises here. We want to make sure that federal collaborators are brought in fully aware and fully invested in the project. Uh, any federal collaborators requesting funding for those allowed, um, those allowed situations um, are going to need to submit a full letter of support whereas unfunded collaborators are only required to submit a collaboration form. The collaboration form is attached to the NOFO and grants.gov. Any funding requested by federal collaborators, with the exception of the pre-agreed upon overhead costs, may not exceed 20% of the proposed total budget to maintain our goal of supporting primarily external researchers. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've talked about the who um, and the what so far, so let's move a little bit more into the how. The application process, it is live now. Uh, the NOFO is available on grants.gov. Please access it through that website and you can go to grants.gov and search for the weather program office and it should pop up right at the top of the list. Um, letters of intent, which are pre-proposal um, letters to just sort of, as it, as it states, um, state your intent to potentially submit a proposal we are accepting those up until September 15th um, at 5 p.m. Eastern time. So that's coming up really quickly. I'll talk a little bit more about LOIs in a second. Those are submitted online via the form or email. We'll have more information about that too. Um, and that is open now until September 15th. Um, any responses to an LOI where you'll receive some feedback on, on your, basic, um, your basic outline of a potential proposal You'll receive a response within a month or so, up to maybe approximately October 19th. Um, the big deadline, though, that everybody needs to be aware of is November 17th, 2022, 5 p.m. Eastern Time. That is a hard deadline for the full proposals. Any proposals submitted afterwards will not be accepted or, or reviewed. Um, that will not be extended. Um, award decisions will be made in the late spring of 2023, um, assuming everything goes well with the budget process. Next slide, please. Okay, diving more into the letters of intent. So LOIs are not required, they're not mandatory. However, we strongly, strongly encourage any potential applicants to submit an LOI. An LOI allows you to receive initial feedback on an, an idea for a full proposal without being rejected or, or anything along those lines. Um, and it, it both allows WPO to get a sense of the sort of proposals that are coming in and also allows applicants to get that initial feedback to tailor their proposals based on um, a non-binding uh, review of an LOI. It's a simple two-page research summary uh, with a basic project outline budget description of the applications of the research. Um, and the recommendation that you'll receive from the reviewers is just a simple encouragement or uh, discouragement on whether to proceed with a full proposal. Again, these are non-binding. If you receive a discouraging response, you might still be able to uh, rework your uh, project idea, come up with a much better proposal, and still submit. You are not disqualified if you receive a letter discouraging you. LOIs do need to be submitted by the 15th um, at 5 p.m. Eastern time um, via the digital form at the link on the screen. That's tinyurl.com slash FY23WPO competition. We, will, we strongly encourage you to use that form um, or submit via email if you're more comfortable to oer.wpo.competitions 
make sure you put that S, it's plural competitions, at NOAA.gov. Um, and so we look forward to receiving letters of intent. Um, next slide, please. So after a letter of intent is submitted, um, and say you, you've received a very encouraging response, or you have another idea that you'd like to move forward with a full proposal, this is where we start to move into the meat that I want you know, everybody to take away here. Um, so the components for a full proposal are listed on the screen. These are what we refer to as the minimum requirements. So if you're skipping any of these, um, any of these sections, that's, that's not really acceptable. We're not going to be able to uh, score your proposal alongside any of the others. So each one of these sections on here is extremely critical to understand what research is being proposed, how it can be applied, and whether it fits into, um, into the budget and strategic goals that we've set in place. So a plain language abstract, the research plan, uh, relevance to specific competition focus areas. And when we say focus areas, we're talking about specific competitions. So whether it's the Vortex USA competition or the social behavioral sciences uh, competition, we're talking about specific competitions, not just to WPO at large. Data management plans, um, HPC requirements, budgetary information, all that is required as part of, part of the full proposal as well, uh, in addition um, to contact information and a statement on diversity and inclusion. Uh, next slide, please. So once a full proposal is submitted, we want to be transparent and give more information on how the proposals are scored and selected. So as long as the proposal meets those minimum requirements, we will move on to a full review where each proposal is scored up against the other proposals submitted to the specific competition. Each review is conducted by a panel of at least three peers, three experts, and their scores are averaged. Each one of the reviews, this is something that we're taking very seriously this year, each review will be quality controlled for fairness um, and thoroughness. So the scores are as follows. For this year, the relevance to the program goals and the merit in terms of science and technical uh, methodologies that are laid out make up a total of two thirds of the total score. Qualif qualifications of applicants, the cost of the project, and the activities and integration of education, outreach, diversity, and inclusion, those all make up the remaining third of the total score. So each one of these is significant in terms of the overall, um, the overall uh, score and whether this will be selected. As John mentioned early on, we do have a uh, potential rarely to select out of the rank order if proposals score similarly, depending on funding availability and the program priorities that are being addressed. We'll move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so these are some additional important considerations for PIs. So if you're considering to submit, if you're moving forward with the process, uh, please be aware, you are allowed to submit to multiple competitions as long as you're submitting different proposals to different competitions. Uh, so you cannot submit the same proposal to multiple competitions. Um, if you do, we'll only select the first one um, that was submitted, the rest get thrown out without review. Um, we mentioned before, and, and I can't stress this enough, make sure that you're identifying and engaging with partners throughout the entire process, working with colleagues, working with other PIs, um, working with experts in operations, if you're moving towards an operational system, whatever your application is going to be for the R&D that you'll be working with. Um, if you're be, going to be working with a test bed or proving ground, coordinate ahead of time to make sure that they fit into, that you fit into the plans, that you're appropriately um, working with the test bed manager um, to think about what schedule needs to take place. Um, don't propose specific operational transitions to the weather service because we can't, we can't fund that. Um, any operational transitions within NOAA, whether it's to weather service, which most of WPO's transitions are, but even if it's to another line office within NOAA, the transition beyond OAR is not covered by the grants or awards in this funding competition. Um, so it's perfectly acceptable to kind of lay out what the ultimate goal of the proposal um, is going to be, how it could be applied to an operational system. Um, and partners within weather service can help lay that out and maybe plan for beyond the end of the award. But that can't be part of the, the award itself. And finally, this is something that trips up a lot of folks as well. Um, an important consideration um, in particular with any project involving test beds um, or social science work, 
collecting data and information from human subjects. Um, there's something called an institutional review board um, at, fund, at um, universities and other institutions, research institutions, that have mandatory requirements uh, to document all human subject research. That does include uh, collecting information from um, quote unquote human subjects, uh, such as forecasters taking part in a testbed experiment. Um, don't let that sound too intimidating, even though it kind of does, I'll be honest. Um, but there is a process in place through OMB and, and um, in, in coordination with the Paperwork Reduction Act. Um, it is mandatory if NOAA is, uh, is assisting you in reaching out um, or to or recruiting human subjects on your behalf. So just be aware of this. Specifics are included in the NOFO um, and uh, additional information there. So we'll move on to the next slide, please. Um, all right, so we have some common mistakes that I really want to highlight here to make sure that, you're, uh, that, that you are able to avoid if you want to proceed with a full application. Um, I mentioned the minimum requirements before, and I can't stress enough. This is the number one thing. If your proposal is late, incomplete, or just generally not following the guidelines, it's going to not proceed on to a full review. Um, it will be rejected right at the beginning, and you won't have a chance for funding. So please make sure that you're, you're comfortable with the minimum requirements. Again, go through them with a fine tooth comb in the NOFO. Make sure that you're applying to the correct competition. Um, triple check that you're aligned with the competition science priorities that we just talked about earlier. Make sure you're thinking about the big picture. You know, we are focusing on advancing research, enabling transitions, and think about the end user. Um, so what happens after the, the project ends? Um, make sure that you're just right in terms of not being too vague or too narrowly focused so that your R&D is, is refined um, and that you've thought about potential risks, know about potential end uses, um, and that you have a good path forward. Don't over-propose, so don't make sure that you're thinking realistically. And of course, don't ignore any deadlines or wait until the last minute because the folks at your university, at your institution, are going to have to process potentially a number of different proposals in order to get them out through the NOAA grants process. So make sure you're considering them as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is a lot of information, I know. Um, and in addition, there's more information available that is developed by each individual competition. And those are in information sheets that are attached to the NOFO on grants.gov. Make sure you go download the NOFO and also the information sheets to make sure you have all the up-to-date information. The WPO website, which is wpo.noaa.gov, also has additional information. And I will say check back in the next couple of days and weeks for a new website design that we're going to be rolling out shortly. But for now, the, the most important information will be on grants.gov with the WPO NOFO. Um, we will have additional information, again, on the website um, once we have it available. Um, so hopefully this is useful information for all of you. Um, again, I know it's a lot, but for now, I'll, I'll turn it over for Tamara for some of the final considerations. Thanks, Matt. That was awesome information, and I'm sure very helpful to our audience. One of the last things that we actually would like to discuss is the fact that we've given you a lot of information to help you, but here's a way that you can help us. And that is to potentially consider becoming a program reviewer for the WPO, for the Weather Program Office. So we have um, a great set of reviewers that help us to review proposals, but we're always looking for outstanding future reviewers and panelists to serve on our review boards. So if you're interested, um, and again, if you download the handout, you'll see that we have a reviewer application form that's linked on this slide. And if you could complete uh, that link, that form, uh, to let us know if you're potentially interested in being a reviewer for the Weather Program Office, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. You also would need to submit your resume to info.wpo at noaa.gov. So please fill out the reviewer application form and submit your resume to info.wpo at noaa.gov. So again, uh, if you uh, have any information that you would like to follow up or with questions or even after this webinar, if you maybe didn't catch everything and you're a little confused and you wanna work out some details, 
This is a reminder that you're welcome to reach out to any of our competition managers. So that would be Gina Esco for Social and Behavioral Sciences, Mark Vincent for Observations, Jordan Dale for Vortex USA, and Enrique Alves for Innovations for, com for Community Modeling. Also, we'd like to remind you to please check out grants.gov for the official NOFO announcement in detail, as well as that supplemental information that Matt touched on. And you're also welcome to con contact uh, John, Matt, or myself for additional information regarding this NOFO opportunity, or email the office at e uh, oar.wpo.competitions at noaa.gov. Again, that is oar dot wpo dot competitions at noaa.gov so again a reminder of some of those important dates that matt touched on the nofo was published on august 19th 2022 and it is live now so please don't delay if you haven't already had an opportunity to check it out go to grants.gov today download uh, the competition and take a look and see if this is the right nofo with you which we're confident that it is Letters of intent, the deadline is September 15th, 2022, 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern time, Eastern time. So it is not local time, depending on where you are. It is Eastern time, 5 o'clock p.m. September 15th. The proposal application deadline, hard deadline, November 17th, 2022, again at 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. And anticipation of uh, award dates are around May 2023. So with that, we'd like to say thank you for joining us. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd like to now welcome John, Matt, and the other competition managers to come back on screen. And we'll take any questions that you may have. Thanks. Hi, that was wonderful, everybody. Uh, this is Lisa Clark from the No Essential Library. And I will be reading your questions to the panelists today um, until the end of the hour. Uh, just as a reminder, we have about 15 minutes for your questions. Um, go ahead and type them in the questions chat box, which is located in the GoToWebinar control panel, and I'll read them. Also, if you have a specific person you want to answer your question, just let me know. And uh, before I start uh, reading these questions, I also wanna encourage you to download the slides from today's presentation, which are also located in the handouts menu in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, so we got lots of questions while you were presenting. Um, I'm gonna start with one uh, that specifically was from Mark. It asks, Mark, is a list of recommended operational weather stakeholders available? Uh, no, not an exhaustive list, but uh, for the weather service, uh, Jordan Girth from the uh, Weather Service Office of Observations provided himself as a contact, but we call out some of the uh, the uh, other operational stakeholders that you may want to consider, the, the state mesonets, et cetera. So um, uh, there's, you have a lot of flexibility on that. We don't have a prescriptive list. Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, uh, for anyone who wants to answer it. It says, if centers are supported, why are centers not able to request funding to support contractors at the centers? Contractors at centers would increase throughout and allow for rigorous validation the inability to request funding for contractors is a change from past practice a few years ago. So what has changed? You want to think, I, I mean, I can jump in on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, my, it was my understanding that, that that was has been a change over the last few years, but to Matt's um, point um, about making sure that this NOFO is aligned with supporting external investigators. Um, that's why we have, you know, again, the ability um, for, for federal collaborators to um, charge up to 20% for indirect costs or other costs. Um, and then, um, you know, we also have a, a other internal opportunities as well um, that, uh, you know, for example, last year, JTTI or JTI program uh, specifically ran an internal competition. So um, again, the purpose for this NOFO, we're trying to align the NOFO in particular um, to support external um, entities. And, and, and that's why that decision was made a few years back. But Matt, um, I don't want to add anything to that, that answer. Yeah, I'll just say that, um, you know, that's the, it also depends on uh, whether federal 
investigators can be uh, funded also depends very heavily on the type of money or the, the what money is available to us to use from different sources. Um, the funding that is available to be used for the, the sort of work that we're funding right now, um, we, the legal guidance that we have is that it is, a, uh, it is external only um, for, you know, for our specific purposes. Um, and with that decision, the, the contractors that are performing work directly for a federal institution, um, it is best to consider those as federal employees with the same restrictions. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, we have another question here, uh, also not directed at anyone in particular. It asks, the Innovations for Community Modeling Competition states that selected projects will include low cost, high risk, high reward projects at RL two to four, as well as larger collaborative projects starting at RL five and above. What is the upper limit for funding per year for the project to be considered a low cost, high risk, high reward project starting at RL two to four? So I guess I, I can take that. Uh, the upper limit for all proposals is uh, $500,000 per year. So that applies to, to any type of project. So there, there's no specification or distinction between low cost or high cost. We only have an upper limit for all projects that are submitted, all proposals that are submitted under the competition. Thank you. Uh, this next question asks, can you be a co-PI on multiple submissions to either the same or different competitions? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yes, uh, there is no limitation on any specific individual, as long as you're not proposing to uh, be funded for more than you know, your annual salary. That's the biggest limitation. Wonderful. That was very straight, straight, straightforward. Um, this next question asks, how does NOAA define high risk and how will that idea be translated to the reviewers? Well, I think that I'll take that. Uh, high risk is something that not necessarily will convert into an operational application in the outset, but is innovative enough to bring in a new idea that can seed other uh, perspectives or uh, projects that can contribute. That, that seems to be a question specifically to, to the innovation competition. So we're talking here about the UFS, to developing the UFS, to develop, developing NOAA's forecasting uh, systems of the, of the future. So high risk would be that. So it's something that has, you know, if it actually uh, converts into an operational application, it would be a huge benefit but you know, not necessarily uh, maybe clear at the outset that that would be the case. And Thank I'll, you. And I'll just, I can just add also to that, you know, if you go back to the readiness levels and those are, and those are defined um, for NOAA, what those readiness levels can translate to in terms of the definition. Um, you know, that funnel is a funnel on purpose because, because we know that those projects that are at the lowest readiness level are not all gonna make it down into operations. and so. I think if you look at it from that perspective and what sort of how those readiness levels are defined, the lower readiness levels, that may help. Thank you very much. Uh, this next question asks, we are getting equipment from uh, a foreign company. Is this okay, assuming my research institution is able to make such a purchase order? So, I'll, I could take a step. So, I mean, I think uh, I think there are some additional dependencies on there, and we, you know, that might be a very unique situation that we might follow up with you on afterwards. Okay. Uh, this question is specifically for Mark. Mark, it says, priority two under observation competition states analysis of gaps in current observations with OSSEs involving the operational NOAA modeling framework. Could you clarify if the OSSEs must be conducted with NCEP's operational models like UFS, or would it be acceptable if the OSSEs were done with other com community models such as WRF or, or MPAS? 
I think you would have flexibility um, in that. Uh, you know, working with the NOAA models would be preferred, but uh, obviously there's different uh, uh, capabilities um, for uh, doing OSSEs. Uh, so you would have flexibility on that. Thank you, Mark. Next question. Uh, the NOAA OAR WPO 2023-207516 synopsis on grants.gov notes total program funding of $85 million with an award ceiling of $2.5 million and award floor of $1.25 million. Are there additional grant opportunities beyond this NOFO, which states funding of $13.5 million per year across all four competitions? Yeah, so some of those numbers that were put onto the grants.gov overview um, look incorrect. Um, make sure that you're following what is in the document itself in the nofo document those are the correct numbers the 13.5 million dollar per year that is the funding that's available for these four competitions total thank you uh oh go ahead did you have something to say john i was just gonna say and there's and there's no other competition going on this year in, in fi 23 for WPS. so that that is the competition that we have in FY23, 13.5 million. excellent Next question, uh, do I have to use uh, National Weather Service slash NOAA data in my project or is private weather data okay, but using this to expand the application? Uh, is it some of the program managers want to take that for their programs? I think it, it uh, depends. Uh, this, oh, go ahead, Gina. I was just going to say, I, I think it depends. I mean, I, I think what I heard, as long as there's still high relevancy to the NOAA community, I'd say it's okay. I, I think, again, it's sort of like a, a previous question of other information might need to be uh, known to answer that question completely, but I would say my gut reaction is it would be okay. Mark? Yeah, um, you know, we, and for the observations, we purposely use the language, the weather enterprise. So, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, private industries uh, uh, has provided data, mesonets. So uh, we've used lots of non-NOAA data. Wonderful. Thank you. Yep. Uh, uh, this next question asks, for private sector organizations serving as PIs, how valued is it to have academic co-PIs? Uh, th this is Mark. Uh, I would say bring your best PIs to the table. Um, the historically, we've uh, uh, my impression is WPO has funded primarily uh, academic universities, but I know with observations, which may be unique, we've purposely tried to engage the private sector more. So um, we just bring your best PIs. Uh, there's uh, no requirement that uh, they include academics. Fabulous. Um, next question regarding federal collaborator letter of support. Is there a template for the letter of support? If funds are requested, what needs to be in this letter? I don't believe there's a letter of support uh, template, so to speak, but it is uh, it, it's a very basic letter kind of outlining any request for funding, uh, the role the institution will play in the project and the whatever other support is either being provided or being requested by the institution. Um, so it's fairly straightforward and it's really just um, intended to be a way for, um, for a director or a decision maker at a lab or other institution to fully demonstrate that support or request additional support as part of the project. Great, uh, next question. If you have a project that spans multiple competitions priorities, can you submit an LOI to multiple competitions to help find the best fit? So I would recommend uh, submitting one LOI um, and just state, make sure you state within the proposal or within the LOI, or maybe even in a separate email to one of the competition managers state what what you're potentially thinking about doing um, they could potentially guide you to the right competition as well um, great 
Uh, this next question states, in the community modeling dash UFS related competition, will a relatively high readiness level post-processing application using a relatively well-known technique for a specific weather problem, for example, hurricanes, be considered? Or, do, or will such an application score poorly and be more suited for JTTI in the future? I, I think their uh, submissions to, to the innovations competition uh, in the, the NOFO report, we are uh, clear that uh, there's no restriction about the VR level. Uh, but the focus, the scope is really to, uh, to fund innovations. So I, th I think in terms of that question specifically, uh, the, uh, the requirement to be not an incremental change, but actually something that, that has an impact and is innovative, we will consider uh, proposals at any readiness level. Thank you. Um, this next question asks, the modeling program priorities are listed in the NOFO. Links to the three related documents are also included in the NOFO. Do the proposals need to focus only on the priorities directly in the NOFO, or does it also need to address priorities in the supplemental documents? So the, the supplemental documents um, that are provided are intended to build upon what is in the NOFO. So for a specific competition, they should be aligned. Um, as you're addressing individual um, priorities, Make sure that you address the ones that are in the NOFO um, and you can sort of use the supplemental sheets to build on that and, and really build the, the research case. Excellent, thank you. Um, this one says, I have a question from Jose. Applicants are highly encouraged to work with EPIC. Does this mean we need to directly collaborate with them or just use their platforms? Thank you for the question. Uh, it's actually Jose, so thank you for... My apologies. It's okay. Uh, I have a Portuguese language background, so that is that is a common one. And that's why I go by Enrique. Uh, so can you repeat the question, please? You know, my apologies. I just uh, clicked on I clicked on it, so I can't read it back to you. My apologies. It'll be in the, that question can be addressed afterwards. Yeah, I actually I actually remember. So I think uh, I can. No, I, I can recap it to you, Jose, or Jose. Jose. I, I encourage, I, we encourage uh, that a collaboration with EPIC be included. And then again, the collaboration with EPIC means uh, making sure that uh, the uh, proposal is associated with one of the capabilities that we listed in the NOFO, in the information sheet that's provided with the NOFO. So, uh, one of the capabilities is using open source or open development uh, codes using the, the GitHub repository. Uh, other capability is using the automated uh, continuous development uh, CI-CD pipeline that's used basically for testing at different uh, RL levels, and that's going to be available for the community. Also, another capability is uh, using the community infrastructure or uh, uh, contributing to the community infrastructure. Uh, and then again, if you have more questions about, uh, you know, how you can collaborate with EPIC, we're considering options to providing points of contact, uh, bridges, building bridges between the, uh, the applicants and the EPIC program and the EPIC contract. So you can uh, send uh, an email out to our uh, support.epic at noaa.gov email, and we'll be able to, to, to address or uh, to address your question to one of our tech people or within the program itself to, to provide you some guidance. And I actually wanted to go back to one of the questions about uh, links uh, between private industry and academia, particularly in the innovations competition. This is something that, uh, that you know, the, the proposal is to, uh, to link, to interlink the weather enterprise. So uh, that's, that's something that would be very welcome, something that actually links several uh, categories of, of organizations collaborating within a project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and actually, uh, we are hitting the hour, but we do have many questions that were not uh, answered. 
I'm going to let uh, John uh, continue uh, with some last comments, but I, I'm going to just let everybody know if your question was not answered today, I will be forwarding, forwarding them to the panelists and they will be able to answer them offline. So take it away, John. Yeah, thanks. I just want to say um, thank you, everyone, for joining uh, today. Uh, just to follow up with, with Mark and Enrique, we're talking about. I mean, we, we're looking for the best proposals, um, academia, nonprofit, um, private sector, uh, anyone. And so, and some of these competitions, I think, you know, you can see that we're we're, we're asking for sort of a, a breadth of um, of different types of uh, proposals that maybe some in the case of the innovation competition, for example, we haven't really asked for in the past. So. Again, thank you very much. Um, reach out to any of us with any future questions that you may have, um, and um, we'll try to again, address the ones that we have already in the chat. Thank you again. Wonderful. Sorry about that. There were a lot of questions <laughs> which you will be answering. So I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that they would be getting a response later on. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm going to go ahead and end this broadcast, but I appreciate the Weather um, Program Office and all of our panelists for, for joining us today. Have a good day. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.